Okay, very good. Um, <clears throat> I thought we better start with a little bit before we go to water. I'll, I want to tell you a little bit about me because unlike a lot of people at this conference, I'm not a hydrologist, agronomist, geologist, um, I said agronomist already, uh, microbiologist, any of that. Uh, the things that I do are on the right-hand side. They were mentioned briefly in the introduction. Uh, I've chaired a lot of global water policy issues organizations. I have, uh, I was the founding chair of the Davos group that pulled together the business community to start thinking about water issues, which is why they eventually came up with this, hey, this is really important. Uh, I even once, uh, a long, long time ago, went and visited financial analysts and pointed out that if they were worried about water, uh, in terms of the security of what the products they were selling, they should start putting this on their indicators list. That was a long time ago, but this is the kind of thing that you, you have to do. So uh, what I do is strictly, I was on the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on water, uh, so I am not, I depend on the good folk in this room uh, to do the scientific backing. What I work with is the policy issues. So delighted to answer questions, and if they're science questions, I'll probably fend them off somewhere else, but I can tell you how the science questions translate into policy. Okay, where are we going to go? Um, the huge challenge of water, uh, water management, potential solution directions, uh, why good solutions are often over the rainbow, and I see a few people in this room who would probably remember somewhere over the rainbow as a song, or he's all, I'm always chasing rainbows. This is not a compliment. This means that the person is not really getting anywhere. So uh, when you're chasing rainbows, it means you may not be headed in the right direction. <clears throat> this rainbow is an interesting one because it's an Islamic rainbow. Uh, this, was, this is one of the symbols of Islam, which is the rainbow that Allah sends us. Uh, but why there, and also there are some health implications for water management, clearly, uh, and some foreseeable legal challenges which are of interest to people in this room. Are there any pots of gold? That's the real question out there. Uh, because this is a very tough subject simply because of its variety and diversity. So that's why I wanted to add the idea that sustainability, which we've been hearing a lot about, is out there. But how to get to pots of gold, uh, you've really got to have some different issues. Now, this is a very interesting chart. It was put together under the jurisdiction of a woman named Hillary Rodham Clinton. Some of you may remember her name. She was uh, active politically uh, until a little while ago. Uh, when she was Secretary of State, she commissioned this from the Intelligence Unit, not because she wanted to know whether there was enough water for food, but because she wanted to know the security impact for the United States of whether allies around the world actually had enough water so that they were, could be good allies in shared enterprise or whether they were going to be very uh, concentrated on issues arising out of domestic water problems. And the issue, very interesting. That's basically, you don't have to be able to read that, I can just tell you that when you go from the upper left where everybody is made to look comfortable and blue, and down to the lower right uh, where there is, uh, people are living in red and yellow, you know that you're going in a difficult direction. And that is only a 30 year uh, movement. Now you can change, you're all good scientists, you know that you can change any of that so that you can measure a five year, a hundred year, you can make it d look dramatic. But the point is, it is quite dramatic that the number of people that were living in a water secure situation or relatively secure a few short years ago is now migrating very quickly to a world where very large populations are living in a water insecure world for at least part of the year. And this is the why of it. And you could, you could spend a whole day just looking at this particular uh, chart, and I'm not going to make you do that. But what it says is that we live in a watery world, 97% water, but that out of that, when you go into that blue blob, the second one down, only the pale blue is fresh water. So all you've got to work with is 2.5% of all of that water for fresh water to start to do what it is that we need to do with water. Uh, 
And out of that, where is that fresh water? Well, the largest amount is in glaciers, so therefore not readily available, although we're doing our best to melt them. Uh, and, uh, but we, there's a lot tied up in glaciers that probably won't melt in a fashion which is very helpful to most. Uh, and then groundwater, and then um, permafrost, yes, exactly. So what we think of as water, which is lakes and rivers, is 2% of 2% of 2%. So we are not looking at a huge amount of water. Now, you're going to say, but all of this water could be convertible into water for, for all possible uses. Of course it could. But that takes infrastructure, that takes energy, there's a greenhouse gas implication, etc. But that's why I said in my abstract, the world isn't going to run out of water. The question is that a lot of people in the world are not going to have a water for their available use. On the right hand side it says what do we use this water for? And the important thing I would draw your attention to is that agriculture and food is 68 to 70 percent of the water use. Okay. That's the water, water 101 lesson for the day. But you have an idea of what the overall situation is. <clears throat> it's already challenging. We saw, the, uh, we saw the map turning yellow and orange rather than uncomfortable green and blue color. And look what's going to happen. World water demand is projected to grow by 55% to 2050. Those are straight line extrapolations which suggest that there isn't going to be a lot of improvements in the way we do things. And of course, there will be improvements in the way we do things. But you can see that the big growths have been, are in the future, the blue part of the graph, which is irrigated agriculture. But you can also see that they're going to have to start to go down, simply because there is so much demand within cities um, and, for, and for energy. And energy will at least initially trump the demand for agriculture water use. So uh, you've got a struggle that is beginning in most regions now for the uses of water, uh, but a tremendous demand. Why is that going up? Well. We've got this situation. Withdrawals are already exceeding replenishment in those parts. And this is a much more dangerous map than the one that I showed you earlier, because this says that uh, in far too many places of the world, including big food production areas, China, India, the west of the United States, water is being used which is not replenishable by normal rain or by normal flows of water into those water sources. So if withdrawals are already exceeding normal replenishment, we've really got a difficult situation in terms of food and food production. So from this, it's quite easy to put together a major uh, world challenges in water management list. Uh, if you were then saying, okay, so what do we have to manage, you've already got pretty well the idea. 1.2 million people lack reliable, safe water all year long. One out of five child deaths is therefore accountable because of water or dehydration caused by di diarrhea. Important rivers no longer flow into the sea. That's as a result of those two maps together. And so you get the drying up of deltas. You get the change in delta agriculture. You get the problems with deltas, which uh, deltas are, are a huge part of our prosperity in the world. And so therefore, drying up of rivers for some part of the year, and these are big rivers. This is the Indus, the Amudaria, uh, the Nile. If you fly over Egypt, the Nile disappears as you fly towards the Mediterranean. It just turns into little rivulets, something that was a glorious stream uh, in Cairo. This is happening all over the world, so that's a very serious issue. Uh, freshwater fish extinction competes with what we heard yesterday in that excellent presentation on fish about salt water. We've got hypoxic zones, which has already also been mentioned uh, when we've been talking about the fertilizer use and overuse, which is causing uh, this happening in the Gulf of Mexico and other places. We've got in the Ogallala, which is threatened in places, not everywhere, uh, but it was not going to have the water that's needed, and it's a major growth area. Groundwater levels are falling, and we're coping with increasing weather viability, heat, drought, floods, etc. So there's the challenges that have to be managed. Uh, most of those are quantity challenges. The health issues are mostly quality challenges. So quality brings more of the health issues. 80% of sewage in Asia is not treated. It just goes simply into the rivers. And so you've got the pollutants 
Uh, we've been discussing today the pollutants that grow in agriculture. I keep thinking, some of those don't sound too bad compared to the ones that we can grow in sewage. We're really good at growing those, and we don't treat them. And so therefore, uh, th this, is, this is really a health issue now and tomorrow. Water is life, bad water practices, death, illnesses, contagion, misery, etc. Getting to more of anything takes more water, more fertilizer, more industry, and so therefore we can foresee more problem areas in the future. This is a neat chart. Um, it shows what we're asking of our cities. Uh, and we're asking them to move from a water supply city that was back when if you got water to a city that was enough to a sewered city we're moving into Jon Snow and the need to take away sewer products to a drained city so that you start to get move out of malaria and you start to move into healthy cities that have good air too then to a waterways city uh, so that you can start to use the water that you have. Ah, and now we're to, this is the next one, is a great leap upward, a whole cycle city. This is starting to happen in some places of the world where we're using water and then asking of the city that they reuse parts or all of this water. And so they cut down on the, their demand for new water to come into the city. In other words, no more water reservoirs, or at least cutting down the amount of reservoirs or lakes, et cetera, that we're draining to use for cities. This is a fascinating process. I wish we could spend more time on it. But what I want to, to show you is it isn't just in agriculture. Also, cities are having new ways of looking at water and therefore new management challenges. New science, new ideas for water. Well, conservation is the best one of all. Uh, back when the um, Environment Protection Agency in the United States actually started taking some major measures, the conservation impact was huge. Uh, we aren't conserving very much because that means governments have to go out and tell people to use less unless they are willing to use the pricing mechanism. And I think it's a fair judgment to say that the only thing that ministers would less water, less rather do than tell people to use less is to tell them their water price was going to go up. So you've got a dilemma and a horn both in the same place. Uh, we could do more desalination, big costs, big energy, puts more greenhouse gas back in, puts greenhouse gas and in, increases it. New urban water designs, the cell phone, not the landline. Uh, we've uh, got, we've, we've converted ourselves from having to have hundreds of thousands of feet of copper cable into being able to use the, uh, the satellite communication. We can do the same thing with uh, water, toilets, sewage, etc. Not by sending it to satellites, unfortunately, <laughs> but by starting to look, oh, do you think we could try? <laughs> But what we could do is start to become much more decentralized, uh, much using much different technology. Uh, so it, that's probably the most interesting new idea there, and I'm going to come back to it. Buildings that are water neutral, there are some, almost. Uh, water sparing, disease resistant, high yield crops, yes, that's a good one. And wastewater reuse, especially in agriculture. The big problem, do you remember I talked about the rainbow and the leprechauns? Well, we've got a bad leprechaun here. Uh, there are technical challenges, yes, but there's more institutional obstacles. 21st, the 20th century put up wonderfully durable silos, and one silo does not talk to another, whether it's business, whether it's government, uh, whether it's academia. And so therefore, the fact that we could do things because they're in the realm of people's knowledge does not mean we're able to do them because they're not in the realm of the institutional capability because it's very difficult to work across those silos. Food safety and public perception is another, uh, can be an obstacle, can also be uh, a benefit. If you meet them and do it properly, uh, you can advance the things that would also save, save water. Publication, public education and participation, that's a very big one, especially when it comes to water reuse. Acceptability, economic vitality, uh, government support. I used to do a skit about 
when I was looking at water about well, welcoming a new minister of water and saying, oh, welcome, minister. I'm so glad you're here. I'm your deputy minister. Uh, and we need immediately $450 million to fix a lot of sewers uh, that have been left by all of your predecessors in a terrible state. And by the way, we're going to be digging up all of the streets in, all, in the major cities, and you will be really loathed to do this. And there's no ribbon cutting ceremony, and your cabinet colleagues are going to be really unhappy with you because you're going to be taking all the money uh, and you get the idea I mean a water minister when you're con when, uh, when they're confronted with the issues uh, that actually come up is usually not thrilled with their mandate to put it mildly so those are the big problem areas there's some pretty evil at leprechauns that are looking over those Water for agriculture is an essential key. Irrigation efficiency in a number of countries could be greatly improved. Uh, we could certainly cut down on the, on the fertilizer. One out of three sacks of fertilizer actually hits the plant roots. 40% uh, of food waste, we spent so long talking about that in the last session, I won't go through that, but since 68% of water goes into food, if you could cut down 40% of the food waste, you are leaving a lot of water available. Water storage, we need a lot more of, and all the things that bioscience can bring us. Um, it takes a liter of water to produce every calorie. So if you think about how many calories a day you eat and multiply that by the uh, thousand, you get how much water you're actually consuming just in the sheer food that you are eating. Uh, this is a good graph behind us. It's a little out of date, but the, the directions are still the same. It says that uh, from the 1960s to now, there's been a tremendous increase in the amount of calories that people eat around the world. That's a good thing. It means there's prosperity. It means that people are better nourished than they were. But it also means they're eating more calories and so therefore more liters of water. So that's part of the issue here. And it gets worse. A richer world is a more water cereal world. Why? Because they want the protein uh, that goes into uh, food choices when you've got more money. So that purple part of the bar is not the cereals you eat, it's the feed and fodder that we feed to animals so that we can have the protein. We're not doing a lot about trying to make these, and I hope somebody will contradict me about this, but to have more water sparing feed and fodder. I was very gratified to hear that we're actually getting somewhere on fish food on this yesterday. Uh, but food demand doubles over the next 50 years because of diet and population, and the main demand is for feed and fodder, but that demands water, so. Um, up until now, we've coped with this by increasing yields, and we've done not a bad job at all. There's been some sl slowing down in yield increase, but we are reaching the point where it's the source of water that's the issue. It's not how you use it, and it's not the techniques that you use it. Now, this chap is part of the problem. I don't know what crop, crop he's growing, uh, but I never met anybody who could tell me that you needed to be knee ankle deep in the crop in order to uh, make a good job of uh, yield increase. The problem is that when India was having famines, Back in the 60s and 70s, the Indian government decided that having free electricity and unlimited water availability, free water, free electricity, would be a good way to solve the famine. They, what, they were correct, it did. India is now a food exporter, despite having got up to 1.2 billion people. But boy, have they created a tough group of farmers who don't even discuss or want to discuss the amount of water or the amount of electricity that they have the right to because as far as they're concerned it is infinite. So I have Indian political friends who said it's really easy if you want to get unelected. Just talk about the reasonable price for water. There is no reasonable price for water except free in the minds of far too many Indian farmers. So this chap is a real issue for Indian agriculturalists. These chaps are a real issue for politicians in other parts of the world. In other words, we're part of the issue too. And there are some of the pivots that are tremendously water sparing and tremendously water, well water, good, they use water well. There's an awful lot more that don't and you can still see the wonderful sight of a pivot going around at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, with uh, lovely rainbows 
being created uh, in the sky, and of course it's all evaporating. So pivots are neither good nor bad. They can be either one, uh, but they can also be just like our friend here. So can you change that? Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, once decided it would be a good idea to take their fossil water, which had been laid down an awfully long time ago, probably no exaggeration to say close to a million years ago, uh, and they were pulling it up in order to run beef farms and to raise the wheat to feed the beef. Somebody finally talked them out of it. The king aims to retire, rely entirely on imports by 2016. So policies can change, but it's tough. So the big issues moving into new and into new legal areas, water, uh, the perennial southwestern water disputes, uh, the, the predictable ones between Atlanta and Florida, groundwater, fertilizer residue in soil and water, the Flint, Michigan and Toledo disputes with between the utility and the farmers saying, uh, you know, the residue, the, the fertilizer residue is causing more expense in cleaning the water. Unfortunately, the court, court didn't take the chance they had at that time, but they will in the future. Nitrates in France, nitrites in France, uh, groundwater recharge, all of these things of starting to lead to legal battles in cities or in the in countries around the world uh, where uh, the problems come up. Plus the very big issue that I mentioned earlier, 80% of uh, wastewater in Asia and a lot in other parts of the country is not cleaned before it goes into the daily uh, rivers. Uh, and so therefore we've got huge subtractions from the water available, availability simply because of the fact that it's not cleaned. Countries with record of using reuse are growing apace. Now, the blues and the greens here are different stages of water cleaning before reuse, but what I want you to look at is the size of water reuse around the world. It's coming, it's happening. This is no longer something that we used to just talk about. Uh, this is now, and it's, it's more intense in some places, less intense in others. You've got parts of the United States that are refilling aquifers, uh, doing it well, cleaning, uh, cleaning the water first, refilling aquifers, and avoiding having to go to new rivers, new lakes, etc. You've got other parts of the world that are using absolute raw sewage out of a pipe to do fertilizing. Obviously, between the two of those, there are uh, habits and practices which contribute to health, to nutrition, to agriculture, etc. And the task is to move from one to the other. But water reuse is not optional. We have to do this. Proven ideas, uh, greenhouse technology to grow tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplant, etc. Uh, major challenges of water reuse, we talked about that before, health and regulatory, technical challenges, institutional obstacles, the yuck factor, acceptance, and it's going to take a lot of money. Uh, this is your friendly neighborhood uh, vegetable grower, uh, as you can see in the future. Uh, factories uh, that do take water, that do reuse it, and grow all sorts of vegetables. Some of them are absolutely wonderful, flavorful. I've eaten them myself. But this is part of the future, uh, which we can envisage for a food secure future that can also be a water secure future. But that costs. It's no accident that that's in Kuwait. But I've also visited them in Morocco uh, and in other places where it's starting to move in this direction. Canadian environmental cli and climate ministers are asking, okay, what wastewater contaminants do we need to worry about most now and in the future? What are our options to address these? What are the opportunities to trade-offs involved in treatment choices, including resource recovery, cost implications, et cetera? So it's, it's, it's very much moving on to national agendas uh, to get the answers to these questions. The scientists in this room will be well employed for uh, many years to come. There are a lot of questions that we we need answered in order to get to a food, a water secure world. Uh, to conclude with some tantalizing possibilities, solar panels that can pull drinking water out of the air. Uh, there's a, a guy who's put together this machine and he says that in two years it can amortize its cost, it can, feed a f it can supply the drinking water for a family of three in Mexico, pulls the water out of the air and then compresses it, both using uh, solar energy. Uh, and uh, is, uh, is apparently getting affordable. This is one of hundreds of possible little devices, but I just wanted to tell you that a lot of people are working on the issues here. 
Wastewater is a resource, the next frontier for sure. Uh, we've got not just photosynthesis coming, or not just pulling water out of the air, but microbial, electrochemical, cell converting organic wastes into all sorts of things, not just the clean water that we can use, but energy, uh, the kind of uh, food production that we heard about yesterday in the fish area, uh, get taking larvae uh, and uh, making them into the kind of protein that could actually uh, feed other animals and uh, or anaerobic granular sludge, etc. I wish I could go into some of these things, but there's it's really good high science being applied to this, and it's very exciting stuff. Okay, new uses for existing technology. We've had ultraviolet for a long time. We're now starting to make it robust, sufficiently robust to start moving around the world to clean up some of that wastewater that we're not cleaning. Uh, we can enrich the soil with biofertilizers for sustainable food production. Not enough science on, or the dollars to face the water issues. Definitely not enough public uh, and, po and political push. That's the real issue. Uh, so, here's our leprechaun. He's smiling now because he knows that uh, some of the water issues that we talked about really are soluble. Uh, and so therefore he's quite happy that we actually do have the way of getting there. He's thinking that, you know, if you can do all of those things, why can't you find the political will and the public impulse and new financial models to make that happen? So, our job is just to make the leprechaun happy, that's all. Water for all people, water for all purposes, environmental functions, food supply, cities and industry, recreation, transport, and governance that allows good science to happen. Regulation and litigation that facilitates as well as protects us. So there he is. We'll make him happy. Okay, thank you very much.